The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and the arts. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Herb Boyd from the Amsterdam News and City College. Mm -hmm. Welcome to African American Legends. Oh, it's a pleasure. Back with you again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you write about legends and you write about Harlem. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we are in terms of the life in Harlem in 2009, 2010? Mm -hmm. I think we're moving along in uh, general progress. You know, it's hard to measure that mm -hmm. from decade to decade. And that's something I've been working on quite mm -hmm. feverishly now for the last several years in terms of trying to put it in all the, in historical perspective. In, you know, in what context, does it mean? Right. Yeah, try to see, really put it political, cultural, and economic context. And you'll notice that there's a general evolution of a community that occurs and it's kind of like you know fits and starts dribs and drabs ups and downs that happen with all communities uh, currently in Harlem uh, over the last several years has been the whole issue of gentrification mm -hmm. you know what's happening there and as uh, my mentor told me a long time ago I'm talking about Percy uh, Ellis Sutton is that when a community is devastated redevelopment is inevitable you just have to build it back up again and and always, unfortunately, some people get left out in that process. Mm -hmm. You always hope that it's not too much displacement. What I noticed in Harlem, that it was a number of abandoned buildings, mm -hmm. a lot of vacant lots, and that certainly need to be revitalized. And that's where the building took place, when mm -hmm. the city set up a program where they would sell the properties for a dollar to was, developers yes. <clears throat> and then provide some support for them. That's what helped to revive Exactly. 8th Avenue, Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Lenox Avenue, and many of the side streets. Mm -hmm. And many of the people in Harlem were concerned. They said they're displacing us. Yes. Unfortunately, we'd already been displaced yes. because many of the buildings had gone into default. I mean, and people had to leave. Exactly. So what now is happening about the integration of the new residents into Harlem? I think it's kind of a mixed report on that. It, in, on the one hand, you have people who really applaud that because they figure this influx mm -hmm. of uh, people and who have a little bit more of a handle on how community development should proceed. And uh, they'll make enough enough noise to take it down to City Hall, City Hall, mm -hmm. in which uh, we'll have like, improvement in city services, mm -hmm. and that's a critical thing for a lot of people who have been making those demands over the years and getting no response, no response. from City Hall. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, this influx of uh, new people who are very dynamic, mm -hmm. very aggressive. And they're getting they're getting some attention. So you have the improved services up there. That means the the garbage. That means the uh, the post office. That means the sewage. That means the street cleaning. All mm -hmm. of these different kind of things which were like slow or virtually non-existent in the past now has picked up considerably. So I think it has a lot to do with the kind of these young, particularly younger people who are coming in, who are used to a certain kind of lifestyle and expectancy from their city services, and they don't want to be shortchanged on that. So you have like a mixed reviews, people who welcome that. On the other hand, you have some concern that these people are a bit too pushy and too aggressive, mm -hmm. and consequently some of the, the indigenous population get pushed aside and they're concerned about their voices being heard. Well, there's a multiracial group of people who come in, and many of them are white, but many of them are uh, upscale African Americans, exactly. Latinos who are coming in, which changes the economic mix, it changes the cultural mix, and as you say, it changes the demands on the community. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that it had that push pull between the local shops and the large comp companies that are coming in. Oh, yes. How is that working out? Now, that's where it's really problematic because you have the retail giants, Roscoe, who've come in, particularly on the main thoroughfares mm -hmm. there. 125th and, Street, exactly, and Lenox pushed Avenue. Right? All of the uh, small uh, African American minority business owners right out of the picture. Because uh, they can't afford the rent. Exactly. I mean, you talk about the, what they call the platinum zone there between 7th and 8th Avenue between Frederick Douglass Boulevard and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, where it's like $80, $100 a square foot. So that's a, an exorbitant a fee for a lot of the small business. They cannot meet that cost. Consequently, they have to shift, move over to another block mm -hmm. outside of the platinum zone onto to the pewter zone, you might say, where it's mm -hmm. less expensive. Um, at the same time, even those 
areas of the community are being taken over by these retail giants. They've expanded beyond 125th Street. I live uh, around 145th Street, mm -hmm. and they're even there now, yeah. where you mm -hmm. have a subway can suddenly come in and replace where it used to be a mom and pop restaurant. But then no the question there. is, um, if the services were so good that mm -hmm. these people were providing, why didn't they get patronized enough to be able to pay the rents? Oh, yeah, that's, I guess that's the whole problem in terms of what happens with the changing character of a community, mm -hmm. the kind of wealth that's coming in there, the whole tax base that is eroded, mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole class composition of the com com community changes mm -hmm. as a result of that. Uh, the people who, well, once upon a time when you had the kind of a segregated, we were all and multi class. Exactly. Community. It was a mixture there mm -hmm. where you had uh, the doctor who could live right next door to the young man who was working, you know, uh, for the in city. The post office, right. Or, you know, here's the, the shoe, the shoe repair, the cleaners who own these particular mm -hmm. businesses was living right next door to the attorney mm -hmm. and next to the school teacher and everything. But then it began to change because those was a flight that occurred with the middle class outside. Well, when there was suburbs. racial integration. Exactly. Yeah. It opened up. So it always like p a positives and negatives when it comes mm -hmm. to what happens in, a, in communities in terms of this changing overall structure of the society. Mm -hmm. Well, you write for the Amsterdam News. You teach uh, black studies mm -hmm. in City College. And you've written several books, sure. including the one about James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. You know something about the romanticism that relates to Harlem. Mm -hmm. Harlem is a is a brand. Oh, it's yes. a romantic brand. Uh, how do you bring together the realism, the real struggles of people in Harlem, with this romantic view of Harlem of great energy and <laughs> great cultural significance? How do you bring oh, that together? There is the challenge right there. And what I do is like I start, I focus on some of the real, what you might call the icons, mm -hmm. and deliver them to the community because a lot of the younger people know nothing about a James Baldwin, mm -hmm. know nothing about a Sugar Ray Robinson, mm -hmm. know nothing about a, the, the gang, so-called gang of four. Mm -hmm. So all of these things have to be introduced to a new generation. So you start right there with the top tier. Take some of those because they're easier ones to mm -hmm. to relate to, and particularly the older generation. They know who they are, mm -hmm. and so it's like renewing their acquaintance, you know, with this year glorious past mm -hmm. that we've had, going all the way back to the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. They have to understand who the Langston Hughes and the County Cullen, the Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. who these individuals were, mm -hmm. and what they meant to this, the community from a literary standpoint, from a political standpoint, economic standpoint. So. The work you do there, helping people tell their stories. Uh, as a journalist at the Amsterdam News for the last 25 years, that's been my endeavor, is mm -hmm. to be in touch with that community and to deal with those personalities who have been making contributions and the kind of the unsung people. Mm -hmm. I really want to focus on those as mm -hmm. I talk about these glorious ones, mm -hmm. the Jackie Robinsons and what, uh, the Baldwins and, 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 and the uh, Gang of Four, the Wrangles and the Adam Clayton Powells. You also have to talk about those people who are just the ordinary folks on the ground who really hold that community together. And that's well, what I focus you, how on. How do you contextualize this? What is the context? You know, Harlem was primarily an Irish, Jewish, German community at the turn of the century. Historically, yes. And they yes. had the influx of blacks from the South around World War I. Mm -hmm. And then finally, they were all located basically in Harlem and some parts of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And then finally, after World War II, they began to spread out over the city. Sure. But in, in the 20s and the 30s, the glory days, it really was a white folks' haven. They would come there <laughs> right. for culture. They'd come mm -hmm. there for the exotic life in Harlem. Oh, yeah. How, Slumming, how, as they called it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you really contextualize that? That's a very difficult challenge. Or not. Well, I think you just tell it as it was. You know, it's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. That there was a time, mm -hmm. certainly, when Harlem, mm -hmm. you know, you see the changing composition and character and makeup of the community. That's mm -hmm. the, the making of a ghetto, the uh, uh, Gilbert Osowski's book. That's you know, a very fine does book. a good job. Yeah. Black Manhattan by James Weldon mm -hmm. Johnson gives us a nice grasp mm -hmm. and understanding of the 1920s, you see. Mm -hmm. Even there's a book by Dr. Sandra Catherine Wilson that does a good job on the history of, of the Teresa Hotel. Mm -hmm. The history of the Apollo, the history of the Schomburg Center, mm -hmm. the Studio Museum. Once mm -hmm. we understand those particular histories, we can understand the kind of evolving aspect mm -hmm. of that community, the influx of people, the contributions, the West Indians who came into mm -hmm. Harlem in the 1920s, the whole Garvey movement, mm -hmm. uh, A. Philip Randolph. Now, know? that's interesting because you talk about the Garvey movement, A. Philip Randolph, and so on. Mm -hmm. 
why was Harlem sort of the lightning rod for black culture in America? That, that's always a question put to people about the history of Harlem. One of the things is that it's New York City. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the hub of the, the media, the, uh, the uh, industries that have created uh, in terms of clothing, the Broadway, theater, the whole music industry mm -hmm. here in terms of Tin Pan Alley, all of those things were a part of the New York. Mm -hmm. So on the periphery or what you might say on the borders of all these things were blacks intruded them or in, it kind of in, in, insinuated themselves into all of these different venues. Mm -hmm. Look at, take Broadway for example. Uh, you take a James Weldon Johnson, a Bob Cole, Will Marion Cook, uh, James J. Rossman Johnson, James Weldon Johnson's brother. Mm -hmm. They were pretty much the pioneers, along with Noble uh, Sissel and U.B. Blake. And uh, when when Shuffle Along came in, in the 1921, that was a stimulus for Broadway. Broadway musical. Exactly. Yeah. So when Gershwin and Hammerstein and Jerome Kern and mm -hmm. Rogers and Hart, all of them come along, they pick up on the seeds that were planted by these early black pioneers, to say nothing of a James P. Johnson mm -hmm. to a, a W.C. Handy, you know, all of these individuals who were in, in and a part of the Harlem community. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at each one of these here particular trajectories and venues or revenue streams that came out of Harlem that... We were the founders. We put the foundation there. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't it possible that the geography of Harlem had a lot to do with it? It didn't happen in Brooklyn. It happened in Harlem. <laughs> it happened in Harlem, and yes. Harlem was originally developed as a middle-class community for working upwardly mobile people yes. uh, up the New York Central Railroad going north. And then finally we had the subways, exactly. take the A train, you goes to 125th Street right. <laughs> from downtown. Exactly. So there, there, there's something about the geographical contiguity because to go to Brooklyn, you had to go across the Brooklyn Bridge. Yes. The, the uh, subways didn't run quite as much over there. So uh, then you had an influx of people both from the South mm -hmm. and from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was a mix of people who had ambition, had culture, and were interested in trying to move ahead. It was, uh, the way I see Harlem is upwardly mobile for blacks. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the branding part of it. Going all the way back to Pigfoot Mary and Philip Payton, mm -hmm. when the whole housing, and that's a key thing in the development of the community. Now, you mentioned these names, and I know, like you mentioned uh, <laughs> Philip Payton and Pigfoot Mary. What did they do to help to develop Harlem? <laughs> well, the thing about it is that there's the whole housing revolution that occurred, that they spurred that. Yeah, the African-American Realty Company, oh, where they right. put there black folks into those new apartments exactly. up in Harlem and pushed out the white folks so they could <laughs> charge the black folks more. Exactly. And it Philip was, Payton was, was one of the leaders was of a that. pioneer of that in terms of being a realtor mm -hmm. and having the vision mm -hmm. and the opportunity to open the doors mm -hmm. and allow the African American residents mm -hmm. to come into Harlem. Well, of course, you Mary say it's was a right vision. along with it. Maybe he just wanted to make money. Yeah, <laughs> well, of course, they always have that particular thing in mind, but it, the kind of unintended consequences of mm -hmm. making the money is that you're also opening it up mm -hmm. for the housing possibilities right. and getting these apartments, mm -hmm. which even when they came in, they faced with some exorbitant rental fees, That's but some right. of them were prepared to do that. Remember how Strivers Road developed, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the upper black middle class, mm -hmm. you might say, It was came built in. originally for upper class whites. Exactly. they couldn't sell them. They so couldn't that sell it. Even... So you got, you got these empty places, and you almost have a repetition, I mean, a repeat of that mm -hmm. going on right now. We're beginning to look again like it, uh, Harlem looked at the turn of the last century mm -hmm. in terms of the diversity of mm -hmm. that community where people now, you know, the condominiums that are going up and suddenly you have such mm -hmm. a, an exorbitant number of them that mm -hmm. the people are not occupying them. So what are you going to do? These are the prices have to come down. They can't keep building them as they're doing like in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. You just can't keep building when nobody is occupying mm -hmm. what you already have established. Mm -hmm. So. It, it, it creates a real uh, problem there for, you know, the whole housing thing. But housing is important. And then connected with housing, you have all the other, the business and the schooling, to say nothing of the cultural institutions mm -hmm. and how they thrive, you know, on this particular community base, you know. What is that community and what are their expectations? What are their desires, their dreams, their hopes, and how they make their contributions to the community. So you have all these different kind of things. But one of the things, and I think you pointed out, geography is fate. Mm -hmm. 
I think Ralph Ellison said that, yeah. you know, when he was living right in Harlem, when he was writing Invisible Man on uh, St. Nicholas there, well, can the geography average, is fate. Can mm -hmm. the average black person afford to live in Harlem anymore? It depends on where you want to live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's some parts of it you can't afford, mm -hmm. but there's still some segments, some sections mm -hmm. of Harlem that the prices are just not exceedingly out of, out of hand, mm -hmm. where you can still move in there and get something. but. People have to keep up with it, cost of living, you know, I mean, people have property there, you're coming in, and if, what's the market can bear? They try to put it out there. Mm -hmm. If you've got a studio at one time, you can go back when Langston Hughes had a studio in there. It's not going to be the same studio mm -hmm. that you'll find today mm -hmm. where you have like $1,500 a month, mm -hmm. you know, $1,200 a month yeah. to come in. So it means that maybe your living arrangements can't be the same mm -hmm. in terms of you, just you living there. Mm -hmm. You might have to bring in a roommate, maybe mm -hmm. two roommates, in order to well, pay that rent. As mm -hmm. a result of these uh, population and economic changes, is Harlem still the cultural center and the energy center of black New York? Or is it Brooklyn? Is it Bed-Stuy? Is it Southeast Queens, which has the highest average income of blacks anywhere in the country? Mm -hmm. uh, how is that working out? <laughs> or even in uh, outside of New York, the metropolitan area altogether, mm -hmm. when you look at Atlanta mm -hmm. and Chicago and Detroit mm -hmm. and L.A., where other sizable majority black communities exist. And I think it's always this concern about just the metropole or one epicenter of African-American culture. Harlem will always have that, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. It will keep that so long as we have those institutions. If you have the Apollo, mm -hmm. if you have the Schomburg Studio Museum, the National Black Theater, if you have these different kind of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, if you have these kind of things going who enrich their, their objective and mission is to enrich the community culturally. So if you have your institutions who still have that mission and objective clear in mind, it'll never change. Okay, Harlem well, always wh have that. what about major institutions right in Harlem, mm -hmm. uh, City College and Columbia University? Mm -hmm. uh, Columbia is now developing the Manhattanville Project. Sure. They're going to build dormitories and so on. There's a lot of community opposition. Is that going to help the reputation of Harlem? Is it going to enhance it, or is it going to detract from it? It could, it could go both ways. It's, it's all a matter of uh, the kind of vision and what do they have in mind in terms of including the existing community. If they move in such a way as they begin to exclude them, then it could be detrimental. Mm -hmm. But if they find it's going to be an inclusion process, mm -hmm. we're expanding, but not with the, op with the idea of excluding the other parts of the community. They will be involved. And, of course, that means you talk about affordable housing. You know, will that be available? That, that, that probably is the key. Yeah, that's the key thing. If you keep that in place, then you won't antagonize the community so Not much. Not only won't antagonize, you build on the strength of the community because yes. a multi-level community with various social classes is probably more vibrant oh, than yeah. a community that's all upper class or all lower class. Oh, yeah, you have to have that diversity and, and you know, kind of a mixed arrangement in terms of the hierarchy the tiered community, people who are coming in who can afford to, well, affordable housing is always such a relative term, yeah, what's you know, affordable, affordable for right? whom, you know. So I think they have to keep that in mind as they move ahead with these different kind of expansion programs mm -hmm. or redevelopment or, you know. Like well, the key in. to that, mm -hmm. I think, is communication. Yes. The extent to which the Harlem residents and the institutions communicate with mm -hmm. each other. And sometimes that's difficult. You've covered many stories in the press sure. where there were protests against Columbia, protests. Oh, yeah, I covered not, them. <laughs> and not so much protests against City College, but basically, uh, how did that work out? Who, who are the catalysts in that? What are the actors? How is it mm -hmm. working out? Well, one of the things about that is that as a journalist, you're always interested in getting both sides of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you saying? What are your concerns mm -hmm. here? Well, you have people who are like opposed to the expansion saying that it's going to be detrimental to the community because those, the kind of vitality that it had before is no longer there. Yeah, but when they were abandoned buildings, yeah, yeah, but, were, but, what but not, not all of them were abandoned, though. That's yeah. what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Some of these in terms of eminent domain. They, they, that's a key, key question. Yeah, yeah, the eminent domain comes into the picture and people trying to like say, wait a minute now. Uh, what can we get out of this here? That's I think a deal is, has to be cut in mm -hmm. some kind of way and making sure that the people who are there are not being displaced. Mm -hmm. You know, that you make space for them 
once you say we want your property, then mm -hmm. what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. And fortunately, much of that territory in Manhattanville is like, uh, you know, warehouses, mm -hmm. storages and stuff like that, and not so much the housing issue, although there's a sizable community yeah. there that will be displaced, so something has to be mm -hmm. done with that situation. Mm -hmm. So as a journalist, though, Roscoe, you go in there yeah. realizing that you get caught in the middle yeah. between those forces that are opposed and those those forces that are for this kind of advancement. And you try to tell that story in, in a very factual and honest way. And make sure everybody get a chance. And I think communication is important. Mm -hmm. Here's what they're saying, and here's what they're saying mm -hmm. on both sides of the story. And then they have to work that issue out, you know, not only in private, but certainly in public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a couple of major anniversaries coming up mm -hmm. in Harlem, yes. related to Harlem. One is the Amsterdam News, the 100th anniversary. Exactly. And the other is... NAACP. NAACP. Yeah. Now, tell us about the Amsterdam. You've worked there, you know. What has been the role of the Amsterdam in communicating the aspirations and needs and concerns of the Harlem community? Well, it's been a voice for the voiceless, you know. I mean, you talk about a, a newspaper that came into existence in 1909 mm -hmm. and with James Anderson with $10 put together that the people were selling for two cents back in those days mm -hmm. and began to provide a medium uh, or outlook there and a voice for a community that heretofore had not been heard. Uh, after a while, the other black newspapers came into existence, you, the New York Age, the Globe, uh, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American, the, the yeah. Chicago Defender, Michigan Chronicle, the L.A. Sentinel, across the country. But the Amsterdam News was pretty much a pioneer, along with the paper out of Philadelphia. They were the pioneers in this year whole involvement of reaching out and representing that community. Here's what our institutions are doing. Here's some of our important personalities and people, the movers and shakers. Here's some of the issues that we have here that are not being picked up by the mainstream press. So going all the way back to Freedom's Journal, you know, an we will speak our particular concerns and our issues. We will be heard. The Amsterdam News has picked up that cause. You know, I've been there for 25 years now. But now that the major media, mm -hmm. so-called white media, is covering much of the African-American community. Mm -hmm. The circulation of black papers, like all papers, has declined yes. drastically. Uh, what is now the role of the Amsterdam News? That role hasn't changed. That role is, is just as significant today as it was in the past. But its role is effective in terms of the number of people it reaches. Well, yeah. Now, how, how, how does that work? Well, the thing about it is that uh, you'd certainly have all these other uh, what you might call ways and forums that you can pick up information. I guess the average person picks up most of the information looking at television. That's true. Or looking, uh, now the internet has mm -hmm. moved into that mm -hmm. and began to gobble up a, lo a large number of potential readers. But the paper still has that role to play because there's stories that the mainstream media does not pick up. Mm -hmm. Or they'll pick it up, and it's not the right kind of interpretation. But how does that affect the black community? If you have low circulation, mm -hmm. how do you get the word out to the black community? Except well, that I know the white community frequently, when Amsterdam News runs a controversial story, will pick it up mm -hmm. and then talk about it. Well, see, one of the things about circulation, it's hard to measure that. You can say that we got maybe 43,000 that we're putting out there, mm -hmm. but you can't discount, you know, the pass-on rate mm -hmm. that one person reads a paper and passes it on to another person right. and passes mm -hmm. on maybe three or four times. So they're still picking up information, but they're not purchasing the paper. Mm -hmm. Plus, the Amsterdam News is now online. Mm -hmm. They can go online. And and isn't that the future of the journalism? It seems to be. <laughs> it seems to be, uh, Roscoe, mm -hmm. and more and more every day because the mainstream media, when they start laying off people and eliminating their particular issues and editions of the paper, that's a sign of the times. You know, it's a sign that something's wrong and something's happening out there, and we better become aware of it and be alert to the changing aspects of the whole technology and the dissemination of information. You it's, write books. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you expect the things that you write about to reach the general public? Well, you hope you're writing a book that has some kind of impact and influence in their lives, you know, mm -hmm. has some significance for them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
There's still going to be a need for books out there, but even with them, you have this here very the dynamic Kindle, change yeah, in yeah. there because now they're talking about e-books, yeah. and so I'm right in there, audio books. Yeah, okay. Whatever they do, I will be right there with the book because there'll always be a need for a book out there to put under your arm to take on that subway, I'm sure. Now, how do you decide who you're going to write about? You've written about so many legends. Oh, sure. How do you decide who you're going to write about? Well, sometimes my agents make that decision decision for me. They'll say that, hey, Herb, what about this? The the Baldwin book, for example, my agent introduced the idea to me, and I say, well, look, mm -hmm. there's at least four or five decent uh, mm -hmm. uh, biographies out there. Mm -hmm. We need another Baldwin book. Baldwin's Harlem. That's yeah, it. there That's you it. go, That's there it. you go. We take a different angle on it. We'll mm -hmm. look and situate him in a community, because mm -hmm. of all these writers we've had out there, the Richard Wrights, the Ellisons, and what have you, very few of them were born and raised in Harlem. Baldwin was. He mm -hmm. was, but he also lived in France most of the rest oh, of his yeah, life. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's still, no matter where he went, Harlem went with him. Mm -hmm. He found a way, even in his fiction and nonfiction, mm -hmm. he found a way to make sure Harlem was a mm -hmm. part of that particular story and narrative that he was telling, you know. Now, if you wanted to write a book tomorrow mm -hmm. about some icon in the Harlem community, who would it be about? Well, I would tr probably Roscoe Brown would be a good one. <laughs> Thank you. All right, yeah. <laughs> but the, the Gang of Four. We talk now, about, tell us, who are the Gang of Four? A lot of people Basil don't know Patterson, that. who's the governor's father. Uh, a lot of people don't know a lot about him, but mm -hmm. he was a very significant political pioneer. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, David Dinkins, mm -hmm. the first black mayor we've had here in New York mm -hmm. back in 1989. Uh, Charles, Congressman Charles Rangel, the most one of the most powerful political leaders in in the, in the world, is mm -hmm. the chairman of the uh, House Ways and Means Committee, and of course Percy Ellis Sutton, who, for all of the development and understanding we have about Harlem, he is absolutely central. I would call that I would call it forever friends because their lives have been so interconnected, mm -hmm. so intersected over the years, and the kind of contributions they've made. They create what, what you might call a model in terms of not only friendship, but how four individuals, you know, in their separate capacities have really developed, you know, the Harlem community. And you are writing about the Gag of Four. I'm hoping to do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, today on African American Legends, we've been talking with Herb Boyd from the Amsterdam News and also professor, adjunct professor at City College. And we've been talking about how do we keep the memories and the concerns of Harlem alive. Thanks very much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Always, Roscoe. Good.